We were just talking about, you said you've been really impressed by, by the content and the presentations and the information conveyed mm. uh, over the last sort of day, day and a half. Has that made you more optimistic that policymakers are getting closer to finding solutions to these difficult problems like the trade war? The trade talks continue. Um, I'm not in the room. Um, I think there are a number of people who are in the room and I, I think we're confident that both countries want to find a resolution, certainly a phase one resolution. Um, but as we know, the trade talks are a sort of symbol and a symptom of uh, the need longer term to resolve you know, a broader business and diplomatic relationship between these two important and uh, formidable countries. What should investors do in this environment where there is a lot of m movement in terms of where we are in the negotiations, how optimistic, how cautiously optimistic we are at any given time, things can change with a tweet, you know, with a comment, with a remark? Well, investors respond to volatility, as you know, um, and um, what U.S. investors are looking at is uh, volatility in terms of confidence. Uh, as, and as long as the trade talks continue unresolved, uh, what they know is that chief executives of U.S. companies are going to be reluctant to make definitive capital expenditure decisions. Uh, and that is postponing investment, and that is something which could have an impact on earnings uh, going forward. The, U the U.S. consumer, though, uh, continues to be uh, very much in a spend, spend, spend mode. We have seen that really being confirmed by the latest eco data, right? So if we continue to bank on the trade headlines, what are we going to see in terms of the treasury markets? Is it again sell off on progress and then again buying just because of these pessimistic headlines? Is this a dynamic that we'll continue to see in the meantime until at least we get the phase one deal? Look, we're in, we're in a period of volatility. And one of the things we're focusing on is the economy is slowing down. Uh, we don't really see a recession in the next 12 months. So anything that remotely represents any type of air pocket or, or disruption is going to cause a short-term uh, challenge to confidence. Um, I mean, for example, the, the big black swan of 2019, and the only black swan of 2019 really, has been uh, what's happened in Hong Kong. And um, no one really predicted that. No one really predicted that even though it was something that was clearly bubbling under the surface for mm. a while. When you look at something like Hong Kong and, and the lack of options on the table uh, for both sides, does that make you want to sidestep that market? Very interesting. Hong Kong is a very stable market. If you look at the capital markets mm. over this whole period of volatility and, and even the violence, um, remember the Hong Kong currency is pegged to the dollar. Mm -hmm. um, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is probably one of the most professionally transparent and regulated in the world. It's very much in line with the best of the New York Stock Exchange and the London Stock Exchange. Investors are very comfortable with Hong Kong as a capital market. What's happened in Hong Kong is less in terms of capital market and more at the consumer level. If you talk to the consumer companies here at the conference, they see a marked decline in consumption among luxury products and other types of usage. I mean, even yesterday, one of the credit card companies was telling me the use of their credit card in Hong Kong has declined materially because of, the, of the, what's taking place on the streets. So you're not hearing concern about the money markets in Hong Kong. We are seeing liquidity being squeezed, cash demand up. Also, perhaps some people saying the Hong Kong dollar being pressured away, perhaps, from that currency peg. And one of the things I think we're all excited about is that, remember, in 2020, China is going to open up their financial services market to uh, international ownership and control. And I, I'm, I'm actually hoping we can use this, in fact, to rebalance the discussions on the U.S.-China relationship, because it's been very focused on technology. But when you actually look at financial services, the Chinese have been very open-minded about bringing financial institutions, international financial institutions into their market. It's a $43 trillion market and they want international expertise and experience in that market. So 2020 is important. PIMCO is very excited about the Chinese market because it's a, it's a $12 trillion bond market. It's actually a bigger bond market than Japan. Will you be adding positions in China? 
Uh, we're talking to the CSRC uh, about our business strategy there. It's a strategic priority. Uh, we have uh, uh, a position right now uh, in Shanghai, but uh, we have an ongoing discussion. And we, of course, have prioritized China through our emerging markets uh, vehicles, but we are going to take it a step further uh, in, in it, 2020. What will it depend on, taking it a step further? Um, I think we're confident that the Chinese government is very um, uh, open about how it involves international players in this market. Let's remember something. China has always strategically invited foreigners in where they felt they, they didn't have a strong expertise. They see particularly American institutions as having Just strong because expertise. Because let's face it, the Chinese banking sector for a number of years hasn't exactly been, you know, an easy or an attractive space for, for foreign investors to wander into. I, I'm familiar with that, but I'm also very focused on 2020. Uh, and um, all the indications are that it, uh, this transition is going to take place. And to a certain extent, it needs to take place because, remember, China wants to establish further its government bonds and broaden its credit profile mm -hmm. among international investors. Yeah. The trade tensions, the, the, the geopolitical aspect, the kind of populist, I guess, um, sentiment uh, that you see in the headlines, has that negatively impacted investor interest in things like the Bond Connect or Chinese assets overall? Um, a lot of people access China through emerging markets indices mm. and vehicles. Um, and the emerging markets area right now in a number of different uh, strategies remains uh, uh, in a sort of top Cheap. two or three <laughs> top two or three choices. So I would say um, people still see that aspect of it as an attractive bet. We've been talking about the black swan potentially being all of these trade tensions. You like that term, don't right. you? Right, I love it. <laughs> What about the potential one, maybe. Uh, <laughs> encroaching of uh, Fed independence? We have now heard from the uh, Fed pick uh, from President Trump, Judy Shelton, casting doubt on central bank independence. The Fed is an independent group. It's an impressive group. I worked a lot in 2008 when I was managing and overseeing the AIG restructuring. I did a lot of work with the Fed and the New York Fed then, and I saw how well coordinated the Fed was between the PBOC the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, and the European Central Bank. Um, I think Jerome Powell has played this game with a very straight bat. Um, and I think what's interesting is the policy is in a good place, um, but I think what's even more important is he and the president both prioritize two things. They both prioritize the economy, and they both prioritize the labor market. Um, and I think there is a, an enormous amount of respect mm -hmm. at the need to keep the institution independent, and it remains independent.